And so in your towns, you still find these big white men standing as statues. Your cities are still being called by the name of the colonizers. Your rivers is the same thing. And then the borders, oh wow, the borders are still exactly where they were. As Leopold put them, then the question is how civilized, how liberated, how independent are you when your independence now is no longer independence, but it is dependence. And this puts deep context to what I might want to call the French, the Francophone Revolution. In this analysis, I thought that we could understand the Francophone Africa in light of an article that was written by David Hundengin um, on the Africa Report, you see, where he speaks about how we might need to start slowly understanding Francophone Africa from a perspective, um, you know, of... Um, from a perspective that is away from the French colonial tax. We know that the colonial tax was this agreement that was made between France and its colonized uh, nations to still uphold some policies that, you know, put France in the middle of their affairs and that the military coups springing around South Africa, the, uh, West Africa at the moment are actually fighting to free themselves from those agreements, okay? Let's listen to what Joshua Maponga has to say about this and I'll be back for some interesting research on the... Where even when a black person is now in power, he does not remember where he's coming from, but he remembers where the white man wants him to go. So our present governments right now are there to enforce the same principles of what the colonizers were doing. So you come from the war, you've been fighting the liberation struggle, liberation, liberation. But the day you are liberated and you lift up your hand to be sworn in as a president, you are swearing on the white Bible you are swearing into the white parliament that they built. You are swearing on the constitution, on the literature that they're giving you. And you are going to an office that the white men used to sit on. So your ministers and ministries are simply driving the same agenda. The laws of mining have not changed. The laws of land have not changed. The laws of indigenous medicines have not changed. In some certain countries, the laws of indigenous medicines actually fall under witchcraft. The Witchcraft Act. Now, how do you begin to say you are liberated when in fact your liberation has nothing to do with liberating your land, liberating your kings, liberating your culture, liberating your diet, liberating your, your celebrations. And so in your towns, you still find these big white men standing as statues. Your cities are still being called by the name of the colonizers. Your rivers is the same thing. And then the borders, oh wow. The borders are still exactly where they were. As Leopold put them, then the question is how civilized, how liberated, how independent are you when your independence now is no longer independence, but it is dependence. You depend on what? Donor money. You depend on grants. You depend on loans. You depend on the same colonial system to help you to build your... Now, where have you ever seen that happen? that the person who colonized you will help you to build your own country, when in fact it has always been about them building their own spaces. And this puts deep context to what I might want to call the French, the Francophone Revolution, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and all these French once colonized spaces are beginning to wake up and say, no, we can't bang our money with you. No. We can't be watching your TV in our place. No, we're not going to be teaching French in our schools. We are, we're going to find ourselves as Africans. So neocolonialism for me speaks of a system that has been left to run under the management of blacks, but the agenda still remaining as white. And to liberate ourselves will mean we need to deal with the system as it was constructed so that we could build for ourselves a system that works for us. In this research by David Huden, he speaks about how populist politicians may sell the idea of the CFA franc as a colonial tax. So the CFA franc was the currency that was designed by France and to be used by its colonial um, subjects in the post-independent, post-colonial era to continuously control those economies from France. Okay, So it prints out the currency which these countries must constantly use, thereby dictating and augmenting and controlling the economy um, you know, of these countries by manipulating, if it wills, the um, 
that currency, so to speak. So it speaks about how, but not only is France today a different country, but the real powers to watch in West Africa are China and Nigeria. So it says that the story of former Guinean President Sekotore's referendum on whether to join the proposed Communaut Financière Africaine, a monetary union in 1958, is an unpleasant chapter in the history of France's relationship with its former colonial territories. So this was a union in 1958 that was proposed by Charles de Gaulle's government at the time on whether the countries in which France colonized at the time could join this monetary union whereby they would have a, a similar kind of arrangement, I think, with the European Union at the moment. It was a monetary union. So these countries being controlled by, I think it's also an agreement like the Commonwealth uh, Union in West Africa, that this monetary union where France and these countries will keep on uh, a, a relationship uh, at the level of, uh, of the monetary. So it speaks about how that following the 95% no vote in Guinea, Charles de Gaulle government, Charles de Gaulle got angry because the Guinean people at the time didn't want to partake in this kind of union. They had been got it, got it, they had gotten tired of colonialism, French colonialism. They wanted pure independence, and uh, Secretary was actually also a vociferous fighter uh, for freedom in the post-colonial regime in Africa. So it says that as a result of this 95% no vote in Guinea, Charles de Gaulle's government immediately pulled out more than 40, more than 4,000 civil servants, judges, teachers, doctors, and technicians, instructing them to sabotage everything they left behind. So it says that it was the, installing, the ensuing maelstrom of burning books, demolishing buildings, and destroying agricultural implements, uh, you know, and assorted vindicative behavior by the departing French was summed up by a French commentator as un divorce sans pension alimentaire. So it was like a divorce without alimony. It was a really uh, angry outcome. And even the French people who were actually working in Guinea at the time as civil servants were so angry, they burnt everything. Most of the things they had, you know, used to so-called improve the life of the people of Guinea, they actually burnt them all and destroyed them all as they departed Guinea in 1958. However, there were 14 more countries, there were 14 other countries that agreed to be subjects of France at this time. So it said that to the other newly independent French colonies, which were 14 in number, the message was not of a mere divorce. It was an example illustrating the consequences of thumbing your nose at Paris is, you know, and risking losing everything. One of the inauspicious origins came the CFA franc, a twin set of French-baked French-backed currencies used by eight West African countries and six Central African countries. Countries using the CFA, francs, uh, CFA franc are required to store 50% of their country's reserves with the Banque de France and the currencies are pegged to the euro. Okay, so this is how the CFA francs work. So the CFA franc as a currency, unlike we know that Nigeria uses the Naira, it's independent even though it's pegged to the central bank and the central bank is controlled by, you know, um, external external forces, you know, because we know no central bank in any country at the moment and is controlled by that country. But anyway... It speaks about how countries that use the CFA franc, they were required. So the countries that adopted the CFA franc in, uh, you know, in, in West Africa and Central Africa at the moment, they were required to store 50% of their currency reserves with a bank in France, the Central Bank, the Bank de France. And the currencies, the, that CFA franc was pegged to the euro. Okay, so the euro, manipulations of the euro, whatever happened to the euro would affect the CFA franc and the people of the of West Africa, which used the CFA franc, had no say in what that currency, they just had to go with the flow of that currency, okay? Now, it says that to some, this is a beneficial arrangement that ensures that such countries are shielded from the devastating impact of price inflation that something happens in weak African economies that issue their own currency. In other words, the fact that the CFA franc is pegged to the euro would help that those countries that use the CFA franc escape the kind of inflation that would happen in probably like a country like Nigeria that uses a Naira or Ghana that uses the CD uh, in this regard, okay? So Hunde argues that, however, many others see this as new colonial tax. So it's a break on economic growth and an insult to the sovereignty of these 14 countries. And according to this narrative, France, a European behemoth with a 2.5 trillion economy, is actively bullying 14 poor African countries and holding their economies hostage. So this is how Houdin argues and how he sees the CFA franc 
and France's incursion new colonialist hold on these 14 countries in West Africa and Central Africa. However, he argues here that Benin's president, Patrice Talon, has become the most, pro the most pro prominent West African leader to openly express these sentiments with a statement announcing that all eight member countries of the West Africa CFA Union are planning to pull out of the Union. Predictably, the announcement sparked fist pumping around the continent, presumably because it heralds the beginning of the end of a perceived exploitative new colonial relationship. So this is the light in which we can see um, the battle, the military coups that are going on in Niger, in Burkina Faso, uh, in Chad, in Guinea, uh, in Mali at the moment. Okay, So it's kind of like a battle, a war that's against what has been perceived as neocolonialism. So most of these agreements that were made between France and its these 14 countries in West Africa and Central Africa, one of them, especially the use of the CFA franc, another one is that uh, it, uh, a large percentage of the country's resources would be banked in, in a central bank in France. Most of these generals in these countries are really waking up to the light that this is not uh, freedom, this is not independence. We are really being uh, oppressed, again, even, in, even as we claim that we are an independent state and that military coups then then became the vehicle to drive and fight for that uh, you know freedom and i think even many of these countries have actually sent away the foreign military base i think u.s military base and even uh, uh, british or french military bases from their countries because they want to govern their country govern their own resources and have a control over what their countries produce um, as african nations okay so anyway who then continues saying that you know asking the question that is the situation is this the situation in reality? He speaks about how that today's France is not Charles de Gaulle's France. And that a really, a rather unhel unhelpful effect of the framing around the CFA Frank conversation is that France is often typecast as a quintessential colonial power hanging on to its empire by all means, which fits in neatly with the narrative of the CFA Frank being a tool for French neocolonial subjugation in the 21st century. He says that, in fact, France is a remarkably different country now to what it was in the mid-20th century. And that, for one thing, France's ethnic and racial demographics have shifted significantly, showing that a 2008 estimate in the New York Times put the number of black people in France at somewhat between 3 to 5 million people. Now, today's France... Today's France also has millions of people with North Africa's origin, chiefly from Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. And also that exact figures are very difficult to come by because the French constitution expressly forbids collection of ethnic demographic, da demographic data, but it is not hard to see how the very meaning of what it is to be French is rather different to what it was in 1958. France is also witnessing a wave of right-wing populist politicians who make immigration and racial identity the core of their message. So from being fringe figures barely a decade ago, French far-right politicians like Marine Le Pen, which we, many of us know, now sit in the country's National Assembly. And these politicians generally do not sell an expansionist imperial vision of France to their growing audiences, but instead they sell a nativist inward-looking vision of France that portrays African immigration as an existential threat and depicts Francophone Africa as an economic and cultural deadweight that France should cut loose. So Le Pen famously used the CFA franc as a campaign issue during a visit to Chad while running for president in 2017. If elected, she promised to ensure that the currency, the CFA franc, would be abolished and Francophone African countries would be given greater sovereignty to relate with France on their own terms. Her growing election numbers show, showed that it was becoming politically tricky, even within France, to keep the CFA union running. And keeping Africans under their thumb was clearly no longer something that captured the popular French imagination. Now, extrapolating those election results over the past decade and a half, it is safe to assume that at some point, it is the next decade, a majority, that in the next decade, a majority of French voters may actually prefer to get rid of the CFA union altogether, and if it means even controlling African immigration from a position of detachment as the British usually do now. Now, he says that the local politicians in Africa who seized on the CFA colonial tax narrative in the time-honored tradition of empty populist rhetoric are aware of this, but their audiences by and large are not. Now, he says that forget Nigeria. Uh, he say, now, he says that forget France. Nigeria is the real game in town. 
Another feature of the CFA discourse is that it severely overstates the amount of French influence in Francophone West and Central Africa. While former French colonies undoubtedly maintain close business and political links with France for obvious economic and historical reasons, it is not the case that their economies are run on a colonial model. This is Houdin's argument now. He says that with, with every major decision passing through Paris, or at least that is not that is no longer the case. So in other words, according to Houdin, who is this analyst here, he's actually arguing that the agreement in 1958 at the time, this whole monetary union uh, headed by Charles de Gaulle and the, con the what seemed like a new colonialist control of these 14 countries in West Africa and Central Africa by France, is not so much what it is today that many youth in France have been, began questioning that new colonialist relationship with these 14 countries in West Africa and really trying to now inwardly de define and you know, decide their trajectory into the future as a way from having any colonial relationship with these countries. But now Huda is actually arguing that, you know, we should stop seeing France as probably this new colonial, uh, you know, uh, agent in that regard from with this top-down approach in his relationship to these countries, but that we should start looking at Nigeria. And let's, ex let's understand what he means by this regard, because Nigeria has become a dominant player in West Africa, and that probably he's arguing that Nigeria might be assuming uh, a much more new colonialist positionality that France actually earlier on held. But let's continue. So it says that a visit to downtown Abidjan may sometimes feel like an expatriate meeting, but a trip through the countryside and inner cities reveal one universal fact. Nigerians are everywhere. French involvement in these economies is in finance and com commodity trading, alongside ports, telecoms, and infrastructure. But they are no longer the only game in town, however. With Nigerian and Chinese investment in retail, construction, entertainment, and manufacturing, among other driving economic growth in these countries. It is no coincidence that Patrice Talon's pronouncement comes at a time when he is facing severe pressure from the Beninese business lobby as a result of Nigeria's land border closure. Where a giant with real power over Benin's economy is acting recklessly, he has refrained from publicly criticizing Nigeria entirely. The CFA Frank then offers itself a perfect political punching bag, which actually his uh, Hunde is actually arguing that uh, Patrice Talon actually, rather than criticizing Nigeria, because Nigeria is actually now a very big player in the economy of Benin, the, you know, the CFA Frank argument has become a punching bag to really weigh out a lot of the anger of Benin. So he argues that um, it is convenient because it is a silent, almost abstract target that never talks back or imposes sanction. That's France now. So Patrice Talon can actually blame France, the CFA, uh, you know, agreement because it never imposes sanctions and it's a really silent, abstract target. But it also says that it is also suitably emotive from a populist point of view and that it has its basis in French colonization and bad faith actions in 1958 ergo. It must be a bad thing in 2019. So it says that rather than deal with Benin's real economic program, which is near total dependence on trade with Nigeria, Patrice Talon calculates that going after the CFA franc and with a grand announcement that says nothing of any real substance will boost his political capital. This is Hunde you speaking. Judging by the responses to his pronouncement, he calculated correctly. It says that an analyst from West Africa, Kikelomo Shudeko, actually argues that um, as she believes that Talon's announcement is a little more than a political grandstanding with no real intention, um, you know, of taking um, root. But anyway, what Hunde is trying to argue here is that, you know, um, there are other big players on the block, Nigeria and China, and that, you know, um, the constant blame on France actually probably would might we might need to be toned down a little to now start understanding the effect Nigeria and China are actually having in this in these countries in Western in West and South Af uh, Central Africa rather than having this whole angst angst against colonialism. But anyway, many Africans would always come back and bounce back to Hunde and argue that you know colonialism has been uh, part of the 
historical amnesia which we are or Africans actually are unable to uproot from their consciousness and that that psyche needs to be repaired and one of the ways in which um, like Julius Malema usually argues he argues that the colonialists must constantly be reminded of the pain they caused uh, their colonial subjects and so this is probably one of the attitudes and re, um, perspective Africans have to always try to remember the colonialist experiences the post-colonial the pre-colonial uh, the colonial experience anyway especially in francophone Africa and have that as a basis to constantly remind themselves and gain um, a renewed consciousness of their direction for the future but anyway I don't know this has been a lot of information anyway what do you guys think about Joshua McPonga's speech in this video share your thoughts in the comments